Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, your home for movie news, reviews, and movie fan views. This is the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunleavy, joined, as always, by my co-host, Rob Dunham. Well, mostly always. Mostly always. This is true. We did miss one episode this year, so, <laughs> you know, that's fun. <laughs> How you doing, Rob? I'm good. I'm going on vacation tomorrow. Hey, so nothing wrong with that. Looking forward to that going to Delaware to my in-laws' house, uh, my family and kids and my sister's family and kids are all going together. So hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go to the beach on Saturday. So hopefully it doesn't rain. I've been to the beach this year. I need to I need to get some beach time. Yeah, this will be my first time. This will actually be my first time swimming anywhere this summer so i have been looking forward to it for a while nice well aside from our vacation plans we have an excellent show in store for you we're going to be talking about box office numbers from this week we're going to be uh reviewing what's coming out this coming weekend uh and we will look back on a year's worth of podcasts that's right this is episode number 52 of the Film for Fans podcast. That doesn't seem possible. I've been doing this for over a year. Yeah, that doesn't seem possible. (laughs) I know. It's hard to believe, but here it is. So we're going to look back at our very first episode as part of the discussion tonight. And we'll look ahead about what the next year in movies might lead us. And of course, we will talk about our watch list. All right, let's get started. Rob. Old. Yes. Old did pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Old actually topped the box office this past week with uh, almost, well, actually $16.5 million. So number one in the box office this week, Old, $16.5 million. It topped uh, Space Jam. It topped Snake Eyes. And it topped... Black Widow, which is still in, and Fast 7. Uh, big news. This is this is a surprise for people. The industry did not necessarily anticipate old uh, topping the box office. So there's a lot of things that this involves. One is the good performance from old. The second is for the second straight uh, week, we've had a massive drop-off from a movie in its second week, this one being Space Jam, A New Legacy, which uh, took a a pretty big nosedive, which is almost exactly the same thing that happened to Black Widow. What those two films have in common is they both have streaming options. So it seems as though even more that we might be uh, hitting a wall on some of that. Yeah. Um, so what, what did you make of uh, old and uh, and the rest of the box office performances from the last? Yeah, week? I think it's definitely a shock that old uh, is performing the way it is. And I, I really like I'm not I actually I'm not a contributing factor in that because I didn't get to go to any movies this week because my week was ridiculous. Mm. Uh, but I'm looking forward to going to see that and being a part of the massive drop off to the second week, although I don't know if it will have the same. <laughs> <laughs> the others um i think we're seeing it seems like we're seeing uh this drop off because the word of mouth of people seeing it they're telling their friends and then their friends are like watching it at home <laughs> yeah seems to be maybe what's happening because it's not drawing more people out to the theater mm-hmm. either for uh Black Widow, which I thought was very good, or Space Jam, which I thought was good, um, you would think that it wouldn't have such a massive dip, but it seems to be a common theme. So it's not just a Disney Marvel thing. It's a every movie thing. I think, and I definitely think the it could also be a factor of um, anyone who wants to see it in theaters goes opening weekend. And everyone else just watches it online. <laughs> yeah. And it could be, it could be that it could be like you were saying where the word of mouth spreads, but people aren't motivated. Uh, so I think 
we'll, and we'll get, we'll be talking a little bit more about this when we get to uh, our next story as well. But I think uh, we're starting to see the downside of the streaming and simultaneous theater release model that Disney and Warner Brothers have have cooked up here. Yeah. Um, what's interesting too is uh, the strong performance from old actually almost ensures, I mean, basically ensures that this film is going to continue making money and it's going to come out on the positive end money wise uh, because M. Night Shyamalan finances his own films and keeps the budget low. Uh, so this film only cost 18 million to make and it made 16.5 on its opening weekend, uh, plus another 6.5 overseas. So it has technically already uh, made money. That's impressive. And that was honestly uh, one of the hallmarks of his early movies with The Sixth Sense and mm -hmm. uh, Unbreakable even, um, that they were made with not huge budgets. Yeah. And they made a ton of money. And then, uh, some like things like the happening happened where he had more money and obviously um the last airbender which doesn't exist <laughs> was like a ridiculous amount of money so for some reason it seems like if you if you put him in even i i'm pretty sure split didn't even have like a very big budget if mm -hmm. i recall correctly if you put him in an environment where he has less resources to draw on and has to more focus on the storytelling and setting and thing it's things it seems like um those movies outperform what he puts into them it just seems to be a, a trend with the work that he's done yeah i'll talk more about the movie itself when we get down to the uh to the watch list part because they did get a chance to go see nice. this week uh but anyways box office snake guys came in second at 13.3 million uh, four million overseas for that one, and that's on an eighty-eight million dollar budget. Uh, Space Jam, like we said, took a sixty-nine percent decline from the opening weekend. Uh, it only pulled in nine point five million. Wow! So yeah, uh, it it will be interesting to see what happens. But uh, interesting weekend at the box office with uh, old taking the cake. Uh, my, our second story continues along these lines. Uh, Black Widow still out in theaters. Uh, some twists on this one. Scarlett Johansson, after in the wake of uh, the poor second week showing for Black Widow, has sued Disney for breach of contract. Now, what is she claiming the breach is about? Uh, she is claiming that the, uh, the contract, most of her, her uh, salary was supposed to be based on the box office performance. Hmm. And with the simultaneous release in streaming and the, di the direct dip, which we talked about last week, led to some theater owners being really unhappy about it, has cut into the profits uh, that she was supposed to get for this film. Uh, the lawsuit claims that she has uh, that the the decision to do the streaming has cost her more than fifty million dollars on this film, which is not an insignificant amount of money. Yeah. Um, and the story is a little complicated, but it basically says that um, she approached them about renegotiating her contract after the decision was made to release it simultaneously for streaming and in theaters. And they basically rebuffed her. Uh, this is in direct contrast to say things that Warner Brothers has done with their direct streaming model, where they have renegotiated the contracts with the actors. Um, according to this article, uh, have piped out like some two hundred million dollars to cover the differences uh, in contracts. And even though uh, Black Widow performed really well opening weekend, if you're if your contract is still tied to the box office, this was not a welcome development. It seems, yeah, it seems like common sense that you would renegotiate. Yeah. That, especially with the person who's the face of the movie and one of the faces of Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it yeah, seems so surprising. It is. And it will be interesting to see what, uh, 
how much merit it has. Um, just a quick update to the story that came out in the last uh, in the last half hour, 40 minutes, something mm. like that. Um, Disney has responded to this. And um, this this comment from Disney, Disney makes me believe she absolutely has an argument here. <laughs> and that is, they say her suit has no merit whatsoever and say, it is sad and distressing in its callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> so they went straight to, how can you do this during the pandemic as their first line of defense? <laughs> So, uh, to me, that says there's probably some merit to this. <laughs> uh, if that's the if that's the tack that Disney's going to take on this, but this is this is kind of a big deal. We've talked about we've talked about how uh, how the streaming model would would affect studios and theaters and all the effects of it, and we're just seeing the past few weeks a massive amount of of the negative side potentially of the streaming model. So what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it seems like no matter what you do, when you propose a new model for something, and I, I, I would relate this to sports when you think about yeah. instant replay being implemented, I think is a good analogy here because when you do that, you think of all the positive things that will come out of using instant replay and you don't think through the scenarios where it's not going to go exactly as planned and people are going to be frustrated or user error will make it not be as effective as it's supposed to be and so when you develop this idea of co-release with the streaming model you think about all the positive things that can happen more more access for people to be able to see it uh broader audience um health and safety is part of it as well but uh it seems like now we're coming up to those areas of concern that are built off of that that you don't think of right away like obviously disney would not have chosen this model if they thought the star of their movie was going to sue them <laughs> two weeks after it was released mm -hmm. so it's just uh it doesn't seem like the risk analysis was done super well mm -hmm when deciding to move to this model. And I, like you mentioned, Warner Brothers has filled in the gap by providing some supplementary funds, changing contracts a little bit. It seems like they actually looked ahead and saw, mm -hmm. well, this is going to be an issue. If, if it's only in the theater for X amount of time, it's only going to make X amount of dollars. We still have to provide for the people who provided the content. Um, and it doesn't seem like Disney necessarily had that much foresight. And it's, uh, if, if this is happening now, I have a feeling that it's maybe going to happen again, <laughs> or there's going to be more rumblings of actors or actresses who are unhappy yeah. with how their contracts were treated as well. Cause I can't, I, I can't imagine she's the only person who had, has a contract written like this for one of the big movies that they got coming out. Yeah. And I think I've been highly critical of Disney's decision making through all of this. I think they've been late. They've been reactionary. Uh, it hasn't, it seemed at times overly cautious or overly um, like they were willing to subject their movies to absolutely zero risk whatsoever. Um, whereas Warner Brothers, I, I think they went too long with going ahead and declaring that all their movies for the entire year would be would be dual streaming mm -hmm. and, and theaters, but they, it seems like they have a much more cohesive plan and they have a much better model and they've thought through it better. They've, it's just, it seems like that studio has their business handled significantly better. Not that I still think that, you know, the decisions they've made were the, the best, but I think they have done a better job. Yeah. Uh, I, I, would say there's probably no questioning that at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's uh, what is currently in the box office. Let's move to what's coming up this week. So we have three larger releases this week, uh, making it one of the biggest weeks, I think, uh, since the bigger movies started coming back. Uh, we have Jungle Cruise, Stillwater, and The Green Knight. 
Um, Jungle Cruise is, of course, a, another property that's uh, based on a ride starring Emily Blunt and uh, The Rock. I am personally quite intrigued with this film. Um, it's it basically we've talked about it a little bit on the podcast, um, but it's uh, it's based on a Disneyland ride and dangerous animals, reptiles in their natural element. It's a little bit of a period piece. It's kind of an adventure movie. Uh, so that's Jungle Cruise. And um, the next one is Stillwater. And Stillwater is a, a new film, which now I'm trying to pull up the thing. A father travels from Oklahoma to France to help his estranged daughter who is in prison for a murder she claims she didn't commit. This is a Matt Damon movie. And this one has a level of intrigue to it. Uh, and our third one is The Green Knight, which is a, an interesting fantasy uh, movie uh, starring, as I pull one up here, um, it's an interesting fan. I'm actually pretty intrigued with this one, too. I think we've got three good releases coming up. Um, but this is a fantasy retelling of a medieval story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, and this one, pulling up the, this one stars Dev Patel. I was, I was like, I cannot remember his name. Dev <laughs> Patel, uh, Alicia Vikander, Joel Edgerton, uh, to name a few. And Rob, you got, uh, we got three good options here. What are you thinking? Which one intrigues you the most? Yeah, you did say that all three are interesting. I agree. I think this is the first week where I've been like, I want to see all three of those. Yeah. Uh, I guess for different reasons, Matt Damon, uh, I like seeing him in anything. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the trailers for this movie and he's, he uh, definitely seems like he's way into the role. So I think that's going to be pretty impressive to watch. Um, I think out of all three that I would, I'm probably most interested in Jungle Cruise. And I think reading some of the background to it, how they were, uh, how Emily Blunt was comparing it to Romancing the Stone, which my wife loves like i got the i also get that kind of vibe watching the trailers and and hearing and reading more about it and i i'm i'm a pretty big fan of dwayne johnson i think he's a very expressive guy and i think that this is the kind of role where, where he will excel so i'm i'm very interested in seeing that um helps that we went to well i have to find my receipt but we went to applebee's last week and apparently if you go to applebee's like this is, we're not sponsored by Applebee's. <laughs> Although we're willing to be. <laughs> yeah. Please. Um, if you go there for like the next two weeks, uh, for every $25 you spend, if you send your receipt to them, they are giving a ticket for the movie Jungle Cruise through Fandango. Oh. So that's a pretty cool little promotion yeah. that they've got going on. So we ha should have a free ticket coming our way to go see Jungle Cruise, which is always a bonus. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is the type of info you only get here on Film for Fans. Yeah. Go to Applebee's and tell them that we would like them to sponsor us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your waitress will get right on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, I, I am I am most excited about Jungle Cruise because I think it looks like a fun adventure film i'm actually my wife is interested in this one so we're actually going to go see it together which has been forever since her and i have gone to a movie together awesome uh so i'm looking forward to that so um very very looking forward to jungle cruise however i'm really really intrigued by the green knight i'm curious if this is going to be any good the trailers of it look interesting uh, and it looks like uh, it looks like a movie, honestly, that I would I would have thought would have come out in the fall. That kind of uh, of of a deeper intrigue movie that you normally see later in the fall, as opposed to like a summer blockbuster season. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's I think it's got a lot of potential. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I probably would see Stillwater too. So maybe I'll have to go to the theaters a lot this week. <laughs> I still haven't seen Snake Eyes. So I need to get, I need to get on that. Too. So lots of movies to see. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice to have like quality, mm -hmm. like consistent quality is starting to show up. 
which yeah. we did not have a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Just starting to cool. roll around. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm I'm very intrigued to see if they can pull Jungle Cruise out to be good to to be a good movie. Yeah, because if if they can if Disney can pull off two of their theme park rides and turn them into successful movies, uh, look out theme park world. Yeah, the uh, there there was uh, people may not remember now because of how successful it it became, but there was a fair amount of doubt, cynicism around whether Pirates of the Caribbean was going to be any good. Yeah. And uh, I pretty much from the first scene of that movie where Johnny Depp is riding a sinking ship around the corner into the harbor, it's just like instantly grabbed you. Yep. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if Jungle Cruise can provide the same kind of experience. Yeah, I'm hopeful. So we'll see. Uh, but take a chance, get out to your local theater this week and see one of these fantastic movies. All right, Rob, let's hit our discussion. Rewind time. Rewind time. Oh, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So it was uh, a little over a year ago that we actually launched this podcast. The, I think the official date was like July 20th or July hmm. 21st. Um, so a little over a year ago, uh, but we took a week off in December. That's why this is, uh, this is the official hmm. one year mark for our what podcast. What a bunch of slackers. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> So 52 episodes plus a couple of, of special features, uh, quick hits, instant reaction type things that we've launched over the past year. It's been fun. I've, I, it's hard to believe that it's been a year. It really has been. Yeah, it doesn't seem possible. Yeah. And so a year ago, we launched the, the podcast, the, the website, uh, the YouTube channel, and I've enjoyed it. So let's let's just uh, let's look back a little bit. What have you seen over the last year in movies? What what has been your your take? I mean, we've decided to do the ridiculous thing of launching the podcast in the middle of a global pandemic with theater mm-hmm. shut, but that's what we did. Yeah, uh, it's been the thing I've been interested by is how my consumption of movies shifted and then shifted back but also not all the way back because i actually watched black widow in the theater and and then i went home and rented it on disney plus to watch with my wife Hmm. because it was just easier (laughs) Hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i think there's just a whole bunch of people who are who are doing that because of the ease of that model and i I really am interested in seeing where this goes over the next year. And if streaming is made a part of things permanently and how, how it is adjusted to not have issues like Disney is currently having with Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. Um, I was back to the theater fairly early, but only a couple times. I, I wasn't like regularly going back to the theater when it first opened. Um, part of that was that Regal was not open when theaters first reopened. And yeah. I have the, um, Ryan and I both have the subscri- Regal, Regal subscription. And if, if we're going to use that, then it's difficult to go see a whole lot of movies if the place we have the subscription to is not open. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am hoping over the rest of the summer to have a chance to go to a lot more uh, movies this last week was absolutely bananas and i was not able to actually go see anything mm-hmm. uh, there was an anomaly um I, th- I think the the thing the thing that sticks out to me most out of the whole year and we've talked about this briefly is the theater going experience how much i missed the company of strangers mm. yeah uh being able to react to a movie being able to have moments like when I saw Black Widow and the Marvel montage play at the beginning and someone went, (laughs) 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 woo-hoo! 
Uh, little things like that. Even hearing people clap at the end of a movie, which I do very rarely because I I love movies, but I think very few movies deserve that reaction. Um, some yeah. people seem to think that every movie deserves it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but it, it, it has been good to start to get some of that back. And I definitely realize now how much I missed having that uh, co-experience with people who I don't know. Yeah. I, I think for me, what, what's really I've remarked on over the last year is just how much, how much I, how much part of my regular life going to the theater was and being able to rely on, be able to rely on, you see a trailer for a movie, you know, when the movie's going to come out. <laughs> I think that was one of the hardest things is, is dealing with all the delays where, Hey, a movie's coming out here. Hey, the theaters are coming are, and are, are going to open. Oh, wait, never mind. This movie's not opening. The theater's not opening. Uh, just all the back and forth on that was just really difficult to um, difficult to navigate, especially as a movie fan. I think one of the biggest, the biggest ones were like um, tenant bond and, and Dune. And, and just watching those getting bumped back and bumped back and bumped back. And it's like, no, you have teased us enough with this. Let us yeah. have it. Let us have the movies. Um, I like how you said that, like, Dune is not going to be delayed another, like, five times before it I know. actually comes in. I know. It's still ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, geez, come on. <laughs> yeah, ten, ten, Tenet was one that, uh, that was definitely frustrating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I know we were both really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. And just like, it was the waiting of like, okay, it's it's a chicken in the egg type of thing. Theaters want to know, aren't waiting to open until movies are going to be released. Movies don't want to announce the release date until they know when theaters are going to open. And it was like, all right, somebody get off this dance we're doing and just start releasing some movies. So I don't know. But that's, I mean, that was the biggest thing. and and trying to navigate that was was not fun as a movie consumer so yeah, hopefully has, we don't, don't have to go through that again yes for real has the podcast changed how you watch movies over the past year i think that it has encouraged and pushed me to watch a different variety of movies and given what was happening with the theater it pushed me to like explore some different streaming services and see what was actually available and out there mm -hmm. and like i i can't say for sure like what one movie that i think about when i think about this question i i don't know if theaters were operating fully functioning the whole year if a movie like the old yard on netflix is something i would have mm. like gone out of my way to watch mm -hmm. um but because there was so little around on any format when that came out so i saw Lee theron was in it i was like well, let's check this out, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think it was a great movie by any stretch, but it was definitely good, and it would have been something that I might have missed out on if um, it had kind of just been buried in the digital noise, if you would, of all these different streaming platforms. Yeah, I think for me, it's it's changed in in the way... When I've watched movies, I'm always analyzing them, but I'm doing it in my head. And so now as I watch them, knowing I'm going to be talking about them, I have to spend more time thinking, how am I going to explain what I'm thinking about this particular movie? So I think it's caused me to have to think about them differently in a way that I can articulate them that I perhaps had not, uh, had not developed to the extent and I'm still working on that, but developing that to the extent of being able to communicate what I'm thinking about a particular movie or how I feel about it in a more sophisticated way that I haven't had to before because I'm just watching it and experiencing it in my head. I, 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 uh, backpacking off that point, I think that it's also given us a space and freedom to kind of look at movies on a more microscopic detail. Yeah. And one, one I think about uh, with this is 
how we talked about the goldfinch when it first came out and then we revisited it and talked about it like from a broader perspective we're looking at more details or what does this actually mean what are they trying to do with it um where if we if we did not have this outlet to do that that might not be something we would necessarily spend a whole lot of mental energy on <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and i think but i think that kind of discussion is helpful and it encourages people to check things out yeah yeah i agree and i i think it's been it's been helpful for me and i've enjoyed being able to expand my knowledge of movies and expand how I view them and how I think about them. So yeah, it's been good. All right, so let's let's reflect a little bit on our very first episode. Rob, do you remember some of the topics we covered in our very first episode? Was the first episode literally like 45 minutes of us crying because movies didn't exist anymore? <laughs> almost, <laughs> not quite, but almost. <laughs> <laughs> So let's let's test it. Can you come up with any of the topics that we covered on that particular day? The very first episode of Film for Fans. Yes. And this is might be slightly tough because we recorded two test episodes. Yes. Ahead of its actual debut just to kind of see how it would go. So we're not including those. We're talking about the first official episode. I did we talk about drive-in theaters on the first actual episode or was that in one of the test episodes both okay we tested it out on one of the test episodes and it was good so we we redid it for our very first episode yes we talked about drive-in movie theaters i'm proud yeah. of myself i very think that's all good. i remember <laughs> what's funny about this is you've actually in your in the last five minutes you have mentioned two of the other topics that we covered on our very first episode uh, did we talk about the old guard we did. We talked about the old guard. Yes, we, we discussed how the old guard had a massive debut on Netflix when it first came out. And I don't think either one of us had actually watched it at that point. But we were reflecting on does this does this movie is this movie actually good or are we all just bored? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that we had that discussion. Um, and. Uh, from my personal watch list, I talked about the goldfinch. Yeah. We discussed the goldfinch for the first time on our very first episode. Uh, some of the other highlights from it. This episode came out right after Tenant got pulled and infinitely and indefinitely delayed. So one of our stories was about the indefinite delay of Tenant, which was supposed to come out mid-July. Uh, ended up coming out on Labor Day weekend. We uh, discussed drive-ins, as we talked about. We also discussed the 12th anniversary of The Dark Knight. Mm. So we had a good discussion about The Dark Knight. Uh, I covered my watch list. I covered The Goldfinch, The Age of Adeline, and the Reggae Boys uh, soccer documentary that my wife had rented for me for my birthday. Mm. Uh now, I, I'll give you another shot at this. Do you remember there was one movie that you talked about for your watch list? Do you remember what it was? I'll give you a hint. Okay. It was a movie by the actor who probably has the most and the longest amount of references on this show that we talk about frequently and cannot go an episode without mentioning his name. Usually. So it was a Nicolas Cage movie. It was a Nicolas Cage movie. Yes, that is correct. Um, was it Color Out of Space? It was, in fact, Color Out of Space. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and I, have to, I had to bring up one of your quotes from, this, from your review of this movie. This movie is awful, but I can't stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty accurate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Movie changed me in not a great way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. 
So if there's not a more Nick Cage uh, movie review than that, I'm I'm not sure what it is. You could just yeah. put that in tagline next to Nick Cage. Little, little oh, did I know that I would watch okay. Nicolas Cage in the movie Jiu Jitsu later on in the year. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, oh, you did goodness. not learn much of a lesson from the color of yeah. Sports. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. So that was our first episode, 52 episodes ago. And uh, let's let's shift a little bit to uh, to the future. Where do you think it's headed? What? Give me one thing that you uh, that you think uh, is in store for the movie industry in the next year. Uh, hmm. I don't I don't know what exactly is going to happen, but like I said earlier, I'm very intrigued by the play between live release and uh, streaming release. Mm -hmm. and how these companies get things together and what the different studios end up doing modeling wise, because I don't think every studio is going to do things the same way. Uh, HBO max obviously has the tie in with Warner Disney plus the tie in with Disney. Um, Paramount also now has their own. So there's, there's a whole lot of layers here Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I'm, I'm fascinated by where this goes because are there some people who are just never going to come back to the movie theater? Like, are are they going to be content with the digital medium now that they've had access to it and ease of use? Um, Is there enough people who are doing that to justify maintaining a streaming model? Uh, Can these streaming services compete slash survive against things like Netflix and Amazon Prime if they are not having this theater release option? Uh, I think these are all really interesting questions that we'll find out some answers to over the course of the year. Yeah. Um, when, uh, side note, when it comes to the podcast itself, uh, one thing I'm looking forward to slash hoping for um, is that we can do some more content with the website, and that's like a personal probably issue with me (laughs) i haven't done anything (laughs) so i need to not be lazy and uh now that there are movies out in the theater like um some written reviews of things should probably be happening on a more regular basis because there's actually things to review yes (laughs) yeah uh so for the movie industry in general i think one of the things that we're going to see is we're going to see a dropping of the simultaneous release model in favor of a model where we're where it'll be slightly delayed so i think we're talking two months after two to three months it's going to start they're going to start testing out ranges of how far down it can appear on streaming services i think the days of of the long delay between theaters and like your ability to buy the buy the movie or your ability to rent the movie uh, I think that drop off is going to go away. I think as a result of people being used to having a streaming option, I think you're going to see uh, you're going to start to see the movies uh, transition from theaters to streaming significantly quicker. So it's going to be a little bit of a compromise. You're going to drop the simultaneous release model for 2022. However, you're going to start seeing them come out significantly faster on streaming services. And so I'm guessing the different studios will focus on uh, different timelines till they can kind of nail down what what the appropriate timeline is. Is it it six weeks after a movie debuts? Is it two months after a movie debuts in theaters? How long do you wait? Um, But that's that's one of my predictions for what's going to happen. I think another one is you're going to start to see. a more coalescence between uh, the owners of streaming flat fo- platforms and studios, as we saw when uh, it was an Amazon bought MGM Studios. Uh, I think you're going to start to see more of that happening. I bet you um, you're going to see that happen as well. I mean, some of them already own their own streaming services, as you as you mentioned in yours, but I think. Um, the the streaming services will break out the other way into into more of the theatrical releases even netflix has talked about um, um, with their purchase for instance of the knives out 
uh, that those will be theater releases. So mm-hmm. I think you're going to start to see more of it going that way, as opposed, you'll see it, the studios start working more in streaming. And I think you start seeing the streaming services work back into theaters, mm-hmm. which I think will be interesting. And so, yeah, let's get into a little bit about the podcast, uh, possibilities for the podcast uh, in the upcoming year. Um, you are dead right in that we need to get a and their plan is to do a better job of getting re- written reviews and written review content out of, for movies. So we're looking forward to doing some of that. Um, interviews. Mm. Interviews is something that you and I have talked about, and you even did a little bit of legwork on a possible mm-hmm. interview. Uh, so I would love to see us get into some more interviews. I would think I'm hoping that maybe we can even do some live some live content uh, where we've recorded our instant reactions, but maybe we can post something that's live. Mm-hmm. That would be fun to do, uh, to do some live content and, uh, and maybe even we'll look into some kind of a watch party or something like that. That would be cool. Here. That would be fun. So expect more content on the actual website part of it. Um, expect some new and some fresh ideas on the podcast and hopefully we'll uh, continue to be growing the audience. So looking forward to, uh, to the next year of film for fans podcast. And uh, if you have suggestions for us on things you would like to see on content, uh, any of those type of things, send us a message, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you on something you would like to see from us in the podcast. Okay. All right, let's let's go to our watch list. These are movies that we've watched over the last week. We'll give you a brief rundown. You can talk for a minute while I get my phone charger. I'll, I'll work on uh, I'll work on my watch list and ones that we give you uh, reviews on. So this past week for me, uh, I did. Uh, I've been working through the Mission Impossible series, and so I watched Mission Impossible: Ghost Protocol and Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Now, these are the two movies where this series really started hitting its stride. We talked about this last week when I was talking about the first three movies. Is Each one of the first three was very unique. The third, uh, Mission Impossible, started to lay the foundation for what the series would be going forward. But Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, and Rogue Nation really established the the parameters of the series and really gave it a flow and a feel that has carried it through uh, these the three movies that began with Ghost Protocol. So Ghost Protocol is still one of my favorites. I think um, the character interactions are great. The bad guys are great. Uh, and it, for me, features one of the best scenes of the entire series, which is uh, the extended scene that takes place in the Burj Khalifa uh, with Ethan climbing on the outside of the Burj Khalifa and, and just the intrigue of how they did that, where they're faking two different meetings, one floor above each other and trying to sync it up simultaneously. It created some really great drama in that movie. In particular, there's a moment where it shows each each of them walking into their separate hotel rooms and neither one, none of the MI6 agents, uh, Mission Impossible agents, I mean, none of them know whether or not any of these characters have met before and they're all going to be found out. So they really play this out where they walk into the hotel rooms and everyone's just kind of staring at each other and you have no idea whether this is going to work or not. And they hold that moment for a really, really long time. And I love the way they do that. They hold the suspense on that really, really well. Uh, so I, I firmly enjoyed Ghost Protocol. Uh, Rogue Nation is fun because I think it has one of the most dynamic uh, bad guys. Uh, it, it brings up the syndicate and, and the leader of the syndicate. And I think he's a really... He's a really intriguing bad guy. And it also introduces us to Rebecca Ferguson's character. And I think she really, really brought something to the series. Uh, her, her character's inclusion really uh, is something I am glad that they 
I'm glad they brought her in and her work in the, the two movies she's been in so far has been awesome. And I've really enjoyed her role. So that's, uh, that's the two Mission Impossible movies. And then I saw Old. So I will I will avoid spoilers um, for the sake of. Is it about people getting old rapidly? It is. What? It is. I know, right? Ruin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I actually really did enjoy this movie. I thought it was good. Uh, it did not have. I mean, it had some of M Night Shyamalan's particular quirks, which when I mean some of them come in in the form of like dialogue or in terms of, of interest, some interesting camera angles. Um, but I thought it was really, really solid. The characters he developed were good. Their interactions and their reaction to the situation they were in were, I thought were remarkably human. <laughs> and you see people reacting in different ways to the situations and to the stresses that they've been put under. I think he did a great job of maintaining the suspense and the drama throughout. And since it takes place on, on, on such a small area that he was able to craft different feeling and different looking scenes and, and actually some really dynamic moments between the characters and, and managed to still be able to provide things that were unexpected despite um, what seems to be a very straightforward plot. That's that's what I was most interested by. If there were things that you experienced in the movie that you were not necessarily expecting or didn't see happening, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so I, I thought he did a good job with it. I, I think um, it's not a masterpiece like Unbreakable or The Sixth Sense were, uh, but it's a good movie. It's a solid movie, and. Um, definitely avoided some of the things that I think his movies that have been more panned by critics and audiences. I think he avoided some of those things. And I think he's, this is for me, this is like three or four movies in a row now that I think he's done at worst, a good job with. Yeah. So I think the slump for M night Shyamalan is officially over and we can go back to expecting that films that he delivers are going to have quality and going to be solid films. Yeah, I think the the slump is overblown because of how much hatred the last Airbender got, and I, I would say that it deserved the hatred it got. But <laughs> um, it colored uh, all, just his entire reputation from that point on. So it's good to see that he is kind of reworking and coming back out into the light mm -hmm. uh, into some of the things that he is uh, strong in. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what did you watch this week, Rob? This week was the week from Hades. So <laughs> that was just an incredibly busy week. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the only movie that I watched was watching Black Widow again. Okay. Wife, which I got on Disney. Uh, Disney Premier Access on Disney Plus, uh, and it was a fun experience to be able to watch it with her and see her enjoy it. And um, I don't know if that's something I'll do on a regular basis, but it was nice to not have to go anywhere <laughs> to watch the movie. Was there any takeaways you had from having seen it a second time? Because I've only seen it once so far. Right. Uh, I think just uh, further emphasizing the strong performances that created a family dynamic with um, everyone who's involved in her character's family and just uh, intrigued to see more of them and obviously we're going to see more of Florence Pugh because the stinger at the end told us that Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm very interested to see if we're going to see more of David Harbour's character because um, I think that he did an excellent job Mm -hmm. And I, I was even more impressed watching him for his performance again. And I just think to tonally the movie did a really good job. I think it's a, a really well done movie. I was very surprised at the drop off it's had in the box office. Yeah. Um, because I, I think it's a movie that's actually worthy of being in the theater for a while. <laughs> for sure. Having a lot of people go see it. So 
Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I had as far as, uh, I want to say new takeaways, but like just further emphasizing the things that I had experienced before watching it the first time. Okay. All right. Well, we'll close out our show today with our recommendations. And so we're going to recommend a foreign film. So give us, Rob, a foreign film that anyone should go see. See, this might be cheating because I don't really know if this qualifies as a foreign film. It's in a foreign language. Um, but the uh, yeah, one of the first movies that I think of is Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro. Hmm. Um, which is in Spanish. And I I just really am a huge fan of his work. Uh, he has he has just such a great eye for fantasy and being able to provide surprises around the corner and um, being able to create he creates worlds that are accessible and yet there's a terrifying element to almost everything. He creates was terrifying in a way that isn't like you want to run away and hide. It's ter- I, I, I would say it's terrifying in a way that makes you go, huh, I want to figure out what this is about, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I think that is a skill that not many people have. And that might be why he's so successful at what he does. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, there's just a whole bunch of really awesome character design. It's set in the Spanish Civil War. Um the story of the girl that the movie follows is heartbreaking and very moving. And it, it it just, it pulls no punches on the fact that you're watching a fantasy. Like this is not real, even though it's set in a real time and place. Mm -hmm. And I love how he mixes the real world and fantasy um, in most of his movies like that. And uh, so Pan's Labyrinth, I, I don't remember if it's like, El Labyrinth de Pan or something like that uh, in Spanish. It has a Spanish title as well. Um, but yeah, check it out. I, I, I thoroughly recommend that you not just ignore movies because you have to actually do some reading. <laughs> because I think there are some excellent movies out there. And I, I guess my secondary um, honorable mention would be Parasite. I'm not going to talk too much about that because... Uh, we've talked extensively, we talked extensively about that when it came out and that's a movie that you have to read, but I think it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, there, there are movies out there that are not in our language that are still good. Mm-hmm. So I would say don't just discount them because you might have to read while you're watching the movie. It, it, it does not take you out of the movie in most um, circumstances, in my opinion, to have to read subtitles while you're watching. I would say it's a little bit of a detractor for me personally. It's a little bit of a detractor. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing, um, but it's a little, because having to focus on one aspect of the screen just takes away from being able to take right. everything in and causes delay and having to take everything in, but it's still a lot of time. It's still worth it. Yeah. If the movie is good enough uh, for me, I'm going to go with 2005, the protector. 2005 movie, The Protector, starring Tony Jaa. Uh, When I think of foreign films, I think of martial arts films. And Tony Jaa is a fantastic martial artist. He's also known for the Ombak series, which uh, has been a crossover hit in the U.S. as well. But Tony Jaa is just a ridiculous athlete when it comes to martial arts. Um, There's a cool, super cool scene at the beginning of The Protector where it has him standing on the ground facing off with somebody. And then he jumps and does a reverse kick and kicks out a street light. And it's just like, whoa, seriously? Did that just happen? It's, it's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Uh, the plot of the movie is very shallow and superficial. Basically, his pet elephant gets stolen and he goes on a rampage. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, pet elephant, you know, like we all have. We can all. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't have their pet elephant? And, I know, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, but he just goes on an absolute rampage and, and there's, there's several cool elements. One, it has one of those really, really cool uh, continuous shot scenes. He goes into a hotel room and then he just beats up a series of guys as he, as he goes up this ramp and it's all done in one take. And mm. if you, if you 
if you rent the movie or something, see if they have the special features because they talk about how they filmed that particular scene and they even give you some outtakes into uh, times where they've screwed it up and had to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were actually having trouble finding cameramen to be able to do it because the, the big cameras that they were using were too big for like the Asian guys that they had on the camera crew. So they brought in like a German camera crew, but the German guys were too big and couldn't keep up with the pace of the action. So they ended up coming back around to the Asian guys and basically, you know, letting them have a shot at it. Uh, But it was really cool. And then there's just this brutal scene. This is also brutal scene towards the end of the movie where Tony Jaw just goes around and breaks the limbs off of like a hundred dudes. And it's just like, go through, snaps a guy's arm, snaps a guy's leg. It's, it's just, it's so brutal. And they're all laying there with their like limbs all mangled. And it's, it's, it's pretty violent, but it's, it's fantastic. So uh, 2005, The Protector starring Tony Ja. Check it out. That's like the coolest version of Dumbo I've ever heard of. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is the show for tonight. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Film for Fans. Make sure you check out filmforfans.com where the article on the 10, my 10 favorite movie cars is up and officially available for reading. Uh, keep checking back with us on the website. Uh, leave us comments uh, on anything that you'd love to comment on the podcast and share it with your friends. Until next time, enjoy the movies. <laughs>